so excited to learn with you today about the Jews of China enduring survival in the Middle Kingdom. And as usual, we are thrilled to partner with Ortsion, Congregation Ortsion. And with that, I'm going to pass over the intro uh, to my colleague uh, Andre uh, Andre Ivory to introduce our friend James Baskin. Thank you, Rabbi Shmuley. Um, it is great to be here with everyone today. My name is Andre Ivory, Education Director at Congregation Ortsion, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you today um, a wonderful member of our Ortsion family here, Dr. James Baskin. Dr. Baskin received his PhD from Yale University in 2006. His area of academic research is Japanese Buddhism and culture uh, with a focus on how Chinese models represented by the Obaku school were received in Edo period Japan. Other areas of research and writing include Buddhist Christian interaction in early modern Japan, as well as the Zen pure land dialectic as it pertains to Japanese Buddhist discourse. His current project uh, critically examines tea culture in East Asia and how it became widely perceived as inextricab inextricably linked with Zen and its associated arts. Most recently, he held a position as associate professor of Japanese thought at Nagoya City University in Nagoya, Japan. While in Japan, his research was supported by numerous grants from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Apart from his academic pursuits, he's also studied and practiced the tea ceremony, both Sencha and Matcha, as well as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which he currently teaches. In addition, he has nearly completed a book on the cultural history of Jiu Jitsu entitled Jiu Jitsu, A History of Soft Power. I, I'm sure you're going to enjoy his presentation today. And with that, I give you Dr. James Baskin. Thank you uh, very much for that generous introduction. Um, welcome to everybody uh, who's here. You could be any place in the world, of course, and you're here today, so thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, so we can get started right away. Uh, as you heard, my background, just to disclaimer, is in East Asian thoughts, uh, Buddhist thoughts in Japan and China, but you didn't hear, any, you heard about Jesuits and Buddhism, but nothing about Judaism, because that's not really my area of expertise, but this topic today, the Jews in China, is something that I am interested in. I've studied it for a number of years. But um, in my publications, it's not one of my um, areas. So I'm going to assume everybody here is somewhat of a, um, what's the word? Uh, probably this is somewhat beginning, uh, kind of introductory. Um, somebody might know more about this topic than me. And if that's the case, please feel free to interject it during the question and answer session. But this is something that's inherently interesting to me because of my own background. Um, I've spent the majority of my adult life in Asia and uh, growing up Jewish, of course, too. So anyway, let me get started. Okay, so the Jews of China, enduring survival in the Middle Kingdom. These are just some images to kind of wet your palate. We'll visit these later. Um, this is a, a rendering of the, um, the, the synagogue that was in Kaifeng, built in 1163. It was done by some Jesuits who were visiting. Uh, this is a Jewish uh, father and son, somewhat, I think probably at the beginning of the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th. Uh, this is a text that was in the Kaifeng Library. Uh, many of the texts were moved to collections around the world. Um, and as you can see, it's in Hebrew. And these are five girls who made Aliyah uh, from, from China to Israel through Shavei Israel, Israel, which is this organization that brings people uh, to Israel to make Aliyah from these small communities around the world. Um, and again, we'll see them later in our talk. Okay. Uh, this is, well, this is them again. This is in Ben Gurion Air Airport. Uh, I'm going to make sure we have time towards the end to watch a short video that kind of chronicles this and fleshes out a few of the things we're going to talk about today. Now, this first video is just to set the background. I want to look at the state of the Jews of China today how they're faring now. And then we're gonna backtrack to the pre-modern period and we're gonna look at how the origins, okay? Uh, the reason being is it's an ongoing story. History is of course always projected on the present. We talk about it now, it's always now. 
Uh, but it, you know, it's not over. This story is still going. The embers, that is the Kaifeng Jewish community, are still burning, uh, albeit somewhat dimly right now due to our government policy, but there's st it's, it's still an ongoing story that we're all participating in. So I wanna show this video to set the background and then we'll um, talk about the points that are mentioned in it. Time now for focus. The Jewish people around the world may be celebrating Sukkot, but not in one city in eastern China. There, the local authorities have banned Jewish prayer gatherings. It's all part of a wider effort to weaken religious affiliation, when it means one of the first Jewish communities in China is disappearing. Our team went to find out more. They came through that door. China's first Jews. Merchants traveling by the Silk Road who settled in Kaifeng 10 centuries ago. An ancient story that Guo Yin, a guide who is Jewish, introduced to tourists. She knows the history of the oldest Jewish community in China off by heart. But in recent months, she has had nothing to show to visitors. The Chinese authorities have made a clean sweep of the past. So not only here and also uh, and also here we put some Davi stars on the door, but now they cut it. And also we have a Davi star here and they take it. And also we have a tablet to write that here is a study room, a Jewish study. But they also call me, uh, they ask me to take it out. If I don't take it, they will take it. And I didn't come back to take it, and so they took it. A little further on, the local government has even removed the tablet that proves the existence of the former synagogue, which fell into ruins in the 19th century. In 2008, the local government want to rebuild the synagogue as a museum. So they put a tablet here to say, here is the site of the synagogue. But now they move the tablet. In China, only five religions are officially recognized by the state. Judaism is not one of them. This practice is merely tolerated, but recently the Kaifeng Jews have been forced to practice their religion in secret. The local government banned them from meeting. In the community, no one wanted to answer our questions. Only this one woman agreed to receive us on condition of anonymity. She fears reprisals from the authorities. Here's a picture taken from a time when we'd still celebrate Shabbat together, but today it's rare that we meet. We do it all alone at home. In the closed down premises where we had our meeting, there are memories from the time when the Jewish community was able to speak freely. Since the change in policy dictated by central government, some have decided to leave the country. There are people in Kaifeng who left to go to the United States, but not that many. Most of them have left for Israel. There are about 10 who've already left. Young people who want to go there to learn about our religion. Among those who went was Barnaby He, a Taiwanese and US citizen who was the representative in Kaifang of a Center for Chinese and Jewish Studies. Just a few months ago, the authorities closed the institution and he was forced to leave. We talked to Barnaby He in the United States where he now lives. He denounced the policies of President Xi Jinping, who thinks religious organizations with global networks are a threat to China's way of life, as they give foreigners the opportunity to interfere in Chinese society. It's paranoia of foreigners. It's, uh, religion has something to do with it because religion is also a vehicle for a potential uprising. That's also what they're scared of. They've just been told, don't be so public. Because this is, of course, this is a part of a wider, I want to say crackdown, but a wider tightening of religion in general. In Kaifeng, we meet Guo Yen again. To prevent the Jewish heritage of the city completely disappearing, the young woman has turned a small apartment into a museum. In just 15 square meters are all the memories of the Jewish community. Today, in addition to the pressure from authorities, she regrets the departure of the younger Jewish generation of Kaifeng. Israel organization, they're helping the young generations goes back. And uh, the more and more young generations goes back, if all of us go back, uh, maybe this will be disapp uh, disappeared. So we also worry about that. And also what I'm worried about is not only uh, the Kaifeng Jews, but also the Chinese uh, 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 Jewish culture. 
on the floor of her apartment, Guo Yan wants to show us one last thing. So this is a model of the synagogue. A replica built by her father of the former synagogue of Kaifang. Inside the ark, she has carefully preserved the Hebrew Torah that was gifted to her by Jews from Israel. A way for her to continue practicing her religion in front of this homemade shrine. Okay, so as you can see today, the state of the Kaifeng Jews is at one of its nadir, perhaps the most, uh, well, for sure, at one time, a community of 5,000 strong is down to a few hundred, if that, that are maybe less than a few hundred, a hundred that might be involved or engaged in a Jew Jewish practice in some level. Um, there is no real observance in the sense that it's normative, but there are those who have a strong sense of identity, a strong connection to their ancestral faith. Uh, so yes, that still exists. Um, but of course, the reason, as it was mentioned, is that the policies of uh, Xi Jinping, um, the president, uh, is, is quite, well, it is quite restrictive, to say the least. Um, there's over 10 million Muslims. There's, uh, they say, maybe even as many as 100 million Christians and different Catholics, I mean, in different um, denominations. Uh, but this, of course, is still somewhat under the surface. Uh, the number of Jews is very small. It's no threat, but of course, they if we're going to put a, you know, a clamp on religion, they can't make an exception. So all religions are very, very, um, are experiencing a great level of, of repression. Uh, the um, five religions that they mentioned, the five R that are officially recognized, uh, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Protestantism, Catholicism, and Islam. Okay, so three of those are foreign religions to, to China. Uh, we could we'll talk about religion in China in a little bit, which is important to understand the milieu, the background uh, against which this Jewish community was able to, to flourish more or less for a thousand years, or at least continue to exist. Okay, so um, the origins. Let's talk about the origins of the Kaifeng Jews, legends and theories. I have my cards with me. I, high tech and low tech. I have a Zoom going on here with note no cards. I still use them when I talk sometimes. So. In any case, um, so when did the Jews arrive in China? There's a couple theories, uh, some of them um, far fetched, more far fetched than others. Uh, they have their own agenda, the people who came up with these theories, as we'll talk about again. Uh, there's an agenda behind most things. So the early uh, theory is that, well, sometime around 722 BCE, uh, when the Assyrian Empire captured the Northern Kingdom of Israel and the 10 tribes were uh, taken away that one of those tribes uh, found its way to China, okay? Um, this was, again, it's, it's not impossible. I mean, there are, it's, it's totally, you know, possible that this did happen, but there's no record of it. Um, it's possible that somebody got in a boat and went to the New World as well, but there's no record of it. So we're talking about historical, the historical record, okay? Um, this was a theory of the Jesuits and, for something we'll mention later, but of course, the older, the more, the, the more, the greater antiquity that he can assign to the to the Jewish community, the Jesuits, not the Ulici in this case. Well, the more you can perhaps say, hey, this is Christian Judaism um, before the scriptures became quote corrupted because there's no Christological um, prophecies that they wanted. So anyway, we're going to talk about that story later. But this was the theory that the that Matu Ulici and the Jesuits came up with. Uh, after 70 CE sometime when the temple was destroyed, that's another theory, that they made their way to China through Persia um, after the destruction of the second temple. Uh, this would correspond to the, uh, during the reign of the Ming Emperor, of uh, Emperor Ming of the Han. Uh, it's an interesting time that they ascribed to it because this was also the time that Buddhism was said to have arrived. Now, again, there's not one moment that Buddhism arrived, here it is, it's, it happens gradually. So in the early in the centuries BCE, second century, first century, from Central Asia through China, there were definitely Buddhist monks that made their way to China, but there's no real record of that. Uh, the emperor Ming is said to have had a dream in which a golden man appeared to him who had scriptures and he woke from that dream and said, ah, these are the Buddhists. And that was the date, 67 CE, common era that Buddhism is, is said to have come to China formally, okay? Uh, so this theory as well, it's very early. It's most likely, it's not impossible. Uh, it could have, it's very possible that there were some Jews that made their way to China. But again, we have no historical record. Now, what we do know 
um, as much as we can know, is that the Song period, 960 to 1279, one of the high points of, Ch of Chinese culture, um, in terms of literature, everything that we associate, you know, art, porcelain, um, the tea ceremony, as we know in Japan, of course, has its roots in this period as well. Uh, just a very, very rich period of Chinese culture. Um, this is when the Jews came, Baghdadi Jews or a few Persian Jews came over the Silk Road. Um, the Silk Road is something that you probably all have heard of. There's really two Silk Roads. There's the Maritime Silk Road, which became much more common, you know, after, say, the Tang period. Uh, Tang period was from 609 to 618 to 907, 906 CE. Um, so the Maritime Silk Road, you know, which takes a, it's maritime, go by boat. But the, the land, okay, the, the one over the Takamalakan Desert, the Gobi Desert, this is a much more severe, difficult road to, to walk, but that's where the Jews are believed to have come from. And the Kaifeng was the capital of the Song Dynasty during the first half of its existence, which is known as the Northern Song Dynasty. Okay. So let's just say a few words about um, religious culture in China, because this really is the backdrop uh, on which the Jews of China um, had their, their existence and why they were able to persi uh, persist as long as they did in, in large part. And I should also mention that Judaism has had, of course, a certain amount of cult acculturation with the local cultures. Um, and in, here we have a very interesting kind of blend of, of Confucian thought with Judaic values. And uh, it's, it's one chapter, one episode in, his, in human cult culture and history. And I think it's, it's something that's that has a lot of uh, historical value. So we have, these are, religions is not necessarily the best word because where do you draw the line between religion, philosophy? It's very, very uh, subtle in the case of China. Uh, so Confucianism, we could call it a political philosophy, a religion, we could call it, a, you know, there's many different terms, each one accurate to a certain extent. Um, so Confucianism, we all know the name Confucius, the founder of Confucianism, who wrote the Analects, Okay, that's his. That's his, the text attributed to him. Fifth uh, century BCE, he had his the Golden Rule in his writings, very moralistic uh, about you know serving society in some capacity, revere the ancestors, make your offerings to your ancestors. Uh, you know filial piety is number one. It's the most crucial thing. Taking care of your parents, uh, the different relationships to the state, the emperor, the the son of heaven as they call him, the one who's over everybody. Of course, your own parents, your very, very important filial piety. Um, so uh, this is mainstream, is part of the culture, it's woven into the culture. Uh, the communist government was not able to, of course, take out the Confucian elements of Chinese culture. It's, it's very much a part of it. Uh, and also in Korea and Japan, okay? So this is Pan-Asian, um, but it, it's again, it's not necessarily a religion, but they do have religious-like elements. Okay, and then there's Taoism. Taoism is very different. Um, again, most people probably know of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, the very famous text that every um, Chinese child will me memorize the first two stanzas of. Uh, it's very different from Confucianism, whereas a person of an ideal person is a Junzi, will serve society if he has talent or she has talent. They'll serve society, contribute. Whereas the Taoist, you know, kind of has their own more transcendental kind of getting away from societal norms, morality. It's more non-dualistic in its orientation. Dualistic meaning, you know, top, bottom, left, right, up, down, you know, this kind of, if you have a left, you have a right. If you have a tall, you have a short, you can't avoid it. If you have a piece of paper and you don't like the right side or the left side, you can't fold it away. There's always gonna be a left side as long as you have a right side. This is dualistic thought. Taoism kind of gets beyond that by the first two stanzas are, the way that can be weighed is not the eternal way. Way with a W, capital W, W-A-Y, in Chinese, the grammar is very liberal and say open, let, a lot of latitude. The word for say east, dong, can be can mean east, the easterly direction. It can mean east or east as a noun. It can mean easted, ed. I went east, easted. It, it's a it's a verb as well. So w a y e d, not w e i g h e d. Okay, so the way that can be weighed is not the eternal way. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. That which you can point out in name is not real. It's it's ephemeral. It's a convention of language. So this is Taoist thought. Okay, um, Matteo Ricci and the Jesuits particularly railed against this. Uh, they tried to use Confucianism as a way to kind of you know say hey you're Christians like you didn't realize you're all Christians because Confucianism is Christianity. You believe in the one God and 
anyway, it, it's a very interesting text um, called The True Meaning of the Lord of Heaven that Maturichi wrote for the Chinese, um, for, for the Chinese, he wrote in Chinese as well. And then you have Buddhism, which is the Pan-Asian religion, came from India, uh, and of course, founded by the Buddha, uh, in, a North Indian um, prince, and now is, of course, dominant in South Asia and East Asia as well, okay? Life is suffering, you transcend suffering by Enlightenment, through enlightenment. And then you have the, what's called, you know, and it's not really a good name for Southeast Asian Buddhism, it's called Hinayana, which is a name given by the Mahayana, the great tradition to the lesser tradition. Kind of like, you know, Jews don't say the Old Testament, we say the Hebrew scriptures, and Christ, Christians will say the New Testament and the Old Testament. In a similar way, the great vehicle and the lesser vehicle is an appellation from the greater vehicle people in East Asia, North Asia. Uh, okay, so that's more other otherworldly in many ways. And then there's folk religion, which is a mixture of these and other practices. So there's a very accommodating stance of religion in China, and there's no history of anti-Semitism. So what are the names for Jews? Uh, Yotairen, which is a close pronunciation of Yehudai, the Aramaic word for Jew. Then you have uh, another name, the La Maohui, which is uh, the blue hat hui which is contradistinction to the white hat Hui, who are the Muslims. Uh, Hui means to go around something. One of the meanings of the character right here is to circumambulate, probably comes the idea that the Muslims circumambulate the Kaaba. So a Muslim is a Hui, okay, Hui. And the blue hat Hui were the Jews and the white hat Hui were the Muslims. A lot of, throughout a lot of history, the Chinese weren't certain what the Jew and the Muslim, what the differences really were. Uh, then you have an interesting name, somewhat cumbersome, the Tiao Jinjiao, the religion that plucks the sinew. Uh, this is because Genesis 32, 32, we, you must remove the sciatic nerve um, to keep it kosher, right? And the rules of kashrut. So to say, oh, I am the religion that plucks the sinew, it, it's kind of a cumbersome term, but it's also another name for it. Uh, the place of worship, uh, Qing Junsi, uh, purity and truth temple, and also uh, Lu Bai Si, which is the to pray and, oh gosh, the is a place of etiquette and, and prayer. And then another word, the religion of Israel. Okay, this is the approximation of Israel in Chinese pronunciation, Yitzeliya, uh, okay, that's Israel. And then Jiao is teaching, okay? So these are the different names used for Jews. Here's a, give you an example of where it is. Here's Kaifeng right here. Here's Beijing, here's Dunhuan where these caves were discovered, they found some old texts about 1900 or so that had been under the sand for a thousand years. Very interesting story. And there was a mention of some, some Jews, uh, eighth century or so, but these were probably Radnites coming through trading. They, they weren't part of an established community. Okay, so here's a picture of the synagogue uh, of Kaifeng, 1163. Uh, this, as you can tell, uh, very Chinese in architecture. Nothing uh, about this would really stick out as, oh, synagogue, um, which makes sense, of course, uh, more so in China. These, when this was built, the Jewish community had already been cut off from, I wouldn't say normative, because they probably still had normative practices, you know, then, by then, but uh, they had no other contact with Jewish communities outside of China. So the architecture is wholly Chinese in its um, aspect, outer aspect. And even the inside, as, you, as we'll see, is not very different. Um, this is the Jesuit rendering. And this is uh, right here. You can see a smaller, a closer up version of that. Here's the offering table. What you'd see at a Buddhist altar, very similar. You have, this would be uh, full of ash where you'd put incense sticks, offer incense. Uh, these are candles. Uh, so on the surface, this would look like any um, temple uh, that you'd find. Uh, but of course here, instead of housing an image of the Buddha or if it's a Taoist um, temple, um, what is the text? They have the Torah, they have the Torah in here, okay? Here's a scroll, a Torah scroll from Kaifeng. Uh, they have no more, there are no more in, in China proper. They exist in different collections around the world. There's one in the British Museum. Uh, there's one or two, I believe in the Hebrew Union a college library in Cincinnati, uh, and, and some others as well. And they also took a lot of other texts that they had, you know, library in Kaifeng. So nothing remains in Kaifeng, uh, which of course, you know, the discussion of colonial, you know, you know, taking of, of artifacts always comes up, but these most likely would not have survived the cultural revolution in China. 
So the fact that they were taken earlier um, did more or less ensure their survival uh, to the present day. And again, these were looked over very carefully by the Jesuits, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, to make sure that, you know, maybe these Christological uh, prophecies are, are in the, the oldest, what they thought might have been the oldest Torah. And uh, yes, so that story we'll get to in a little bit. There are three stele inscriptions uh, that are dated to 1489, 1512, and 1663. Uh, here's a rubbing of one of them. Uh, they would have been outside in front of the, the synagogue on each side. They uh, tell this very interesting in content. Um, these stele are, were, were rub this rubbing is from a, a Charles White. He was a Canadian, um, uh, he was from the, what was it? It was a ca Canadian, the Anglican church in China. He was a bishop in the Anglican church of Canada. And he was in China. Uh, of course, he was a missionary. And he found these and he made rubbings of them and translated them with his Chinese, with his you know, Chinese counterpart. Uh, he, punctuation means a lot. It's very important when you read Chinese, classical Chinese, or you know, especially like this, without, when there's no punctuation, it's very cumbersome and you have to be very, very careful. So he punctuated the text a certain way. Somebody more recently has done a translation of these um, from a more scholarly perspective, somebody who's trained in Chinese texts which you have to really be to understand what's going on. Uh, they're very interesting. They tell the background of a community in Kaifeng. Uh, there's biblical stories uh, as well. Um, one of them actually has, uh, it took some time for them to realize because they weren't steeped in Judaic studies. They didn't know Judaism very well, Charles White or the Chinese counterpart. But it found, they found, it came, it came to be realized that um, they are actually were the 18 benedictions, the Shimon Esrei, the Amidah, prayer was in Chinese. They had it there in these, in the stele. Um, again, it's very interesting when you translate these, you know, different languages into Chinese. Chinese has a great amount of e economy of language. Um, like I said, one character can be a verb, a noun, an adjective, an adverb. So um, it's very interesting when you see Chinese, two lines of Chinese is about five, six lines of English when it's translated. So anyway, these are records we have of the community, uh, precious ones. And um, the, these rubbings are, are, exist still as well today. Okay, now this is where it gets to be quite uh, interesting. It's kind of like a comedy of errors almost. So we have the uh, encounter with the Jesuits, okay? So these were isolated communities. Matteo Ricci is a great figure in the Jesuit movement. Um, he became a Mandarin, you know, an educated Chinese. He wore the same clothes, became educated in Chinese, could write and speak beautiful Chinese. Um, he introduced European technology and science and all these things that really kind of wowed the Chinese and he used this for his proselytization activities, obviously. But he had, a, you know, quite a big presence. Interestingly enough, Buddhism has quite low status in China compared to Confucianism, you know, the, so he wore the ro robes of a monk uh, at first. And they said to him, you know what, if you want to make converts, change your clothes. So he grew his hair out and, um, became a, what you'd call a Mandarin, an educated Chinese, you know, educated in the Chinese classics, the Confucian classics. And Manasi ben Israel, okay, he's another uh, important person, not a Jesuit, sorry, he's a, a, a Jewish fellow uh, who left Libsyn to Amsterdam. And we're going to talk about him a little bit. But these are the two figures that were very important for the Kaifeng Jews, okay? Uh, though one was a Jesuit, one was a, a rabbi, um, they both played uh, outsized roles in the story of the Kaifeng Jews. So here's a picture of Matteo Ricci. Um, to give you the story, it's quite interesting. In 1605, uh, there was a Chinese fellow named Ai Tian uh, who made his way to Beijing, uh, Peking, to, for, his person, for, for professional reasons. Uh, but he had heard before that there was a new group of white-skinned foreigners um, who had arrived and professed belief in a single God, in one God. Now, what's interesting, he would say, okay, well, you know, Muslims, you know, the Hui, they believe in one God, but they made it clear, they're adamant that this new group, this new religion, if you want to call it new, um, were in China, you know, were not Muslims. They were adamant they were not Muslims and that they still believed in one God. Uh, it should be remembered, of course, this community was cut off from the rest of the Jewish world, the rest of Christian Europe. Um, so they didn't know what Christianity was. Um, if you ask them, you know, 
who is Jesus, they, would, they wouldn't have an answer, which happened, okay? So this is quite an interesting meeting. You have a Jesuit who meets a Chinese who thinks he's meeting a co-religionist, a, a Nestorian Christian. Nestorian Christianity traces its, it, it itself to Nestorius, who died around 450 uh, CE. Uh, basically, the Nestorian, Christ Nestorian Christianity is based on its own kind of Christological, you know, theory of of of, of Jesus Christ, of idea, Jesus the Messiah, as as they that, so Christological theory was different from mainstream Christianity. It didn't persist, but there was a, a a group of Nestorian Christians who lived in China and had a small community for a period of time. So Ricci thought this is a Nestorian Christian, a lost Nestorian Christian, and Itian thought that he was meeting a fellow Jew. So it's quite interesting. So Ricci said, hey, you know, come on in. Um, you know, he thought this, ITN thought this would be great to meet a fellow Jew who could help him revivify um, his community, which had been cut off for, you know, a thousand years roughly uh, from the rest of uh, the, Jew the Jewish world. So uh, interestingly, um, they both thought they were meeting co-religionists and uh, the exchange between them was, was continued in uh, Aichi's study. But first they made a way to the chapel. So this was at the time when Aitian visited at the festival of St. John, St. John the Baptist, in which a painting of the Madonna and child were on one side of the altar and the other side was a young St. John. So Ricci genuflected towards the images and this put Aitian aback a little bit. Um, he assumed, of course, you know, bowing to an image like this, he assumed that the paintings were of Rebecca and Jacob and Esau. Um, so he thought it strange to bow to them, but then interpreted it as showing respect to your ancestors. So he, um, he looked past it. But it wasn't long before they realized that something was amiss. Um, when they continued their conversation uh, to talk, oops, sorry about that, didn't mean to go forward yet. Um, Ricci was the first to realize, of course, because he knew what a Jew was, uh, that Aitian was a Chinese Jew. And I thought Ricci belonged to some breakaway sect of Judaism, um, not knowing the name Christianity, because there was enough there he saw that he thought, okay, this is something I can relate to, one God. And so things kind of rung familiar, but there was enough differences that kind of made him pause. Um, now, Matu Ricci played a very large role. His letters and journals yield more details concerning this, um, the Jews of China than any other report, all of them put together. Um, he was the one who concluded that they had been there since time immemorial and that they were descended from one of the lost 10 tribes. Of course, this idea was brought to Europe and stimulated certain Christian the theologians um, to speculate that the Kaifeng Jews had scriptures that were uncorrupted. Uh, being, of course, that we, I mean, you had Torah, Tanakh in, in Yemen and in other parts of the world that all matched. Um, there was no corruption, of course, but the, holding out this idea that perhaps there was that way, you know, we, there might be a chance that these Christological prophecies we don't find in the Hebrew scriptures are, are still there. Um, so this was the uh, kind of the, the, the motive force for some of these Jesuits to pursue this further. Um, and this and it also set off a prolonged debate. So two years later in uh, 1607, Ricci sent two Chinese converts to Kaifeng to see if there were any Christians in the city and also to collect information on the Jewish community. Well, they were unable to find any Christians, but they did find a synagogue and passed a letter from Ricci to the rabbi at the time. Um, the letter related that the house of worship of the Jesuits in Peking had all the books of the Hebrew Bible but also something they might be very interested in called the New Testament, which um, told the coming of the Messiah 16 centuries earlier. So this left the rabbi, who was an elderly gentleman who was looking to retire, it left him bemused and confused, partly because from a Jewish perspective, he looked at the world and it's obvious the Messiah had not come yet. So he wondered how somebody as senior as Ricci could possibly think that the Messiah had already come. But, you know, he thought this is some kind of eccentricity and was able to look past, past it. So because he was elderly, he wanted to retire and pass the, um, you know, his rabbinate, his to Matteo Ricci. He wanted to invite him as the new head rabbi of the synagogue. But he had one stipulation. He could have his eccentricity and eccentric beliefs, you know, regarding the Messiah. But he did say, if you want to be a rabbi, you have to stop eating pork. Okay. That was the one thing that he was insistent on. 
but this incident with Nietzsche and the, and the Chinese Jews highlights an example of when you don't have a, a Christian background, I mean, a, a backdrop to the story, uh, when the milieu, a non-Abrahamic religion, let's say, a non-Abrahamic milieu where assumptions and prejudices and the context is wholly different, it shows an extremely different dynamic for a Judeo-Christian uh, understanding, especially when it's through the Chinese cultural medium. Because again, it is different as you, as you can really get from you know, uh, what you have in Europe, okay? Um, let's see, we are on time here. I just have to make sure I'm not, whoops. Okay, so that is the story of Mato Ricci. And he was a very important figure for a number of reasons. Um, this, st the story of the uh, Jews in China just set off a real, really stimulated the European imagination. It was a very, it really set it on fire in many ways. Um, and there's, and the reasons for this is at the time uh, in Europe, we're talking in the early 17th century, uh, there was a very strong um, messianic fervor that the coming of, the second coming of Jesus couldn't be too far off, uh, that, you know, it was, it's looking at world events. Um, you know, it, this has happened many times throughout history, but it has to be close. You know, the footsteps of the Messiah, as they say, so this really stimulated the European imagination. And Matteo Ricci being a very prominent Jesuit, his letters carried a lot of weight. And it really, you know, it's many scholars, uh, Christian scholars at the time, uh, were very excited by this. But also some Jews as well. Um, one of them, uh, Manasseh ben Israel, uh, is the son of Jews who um, converted on the surface Christianity, uh, but practiced Judaism secretly in Lisbon. Uh, the word is Marano, but I don't like that word because it means swine. Uh, so he was a, 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 a the converse, those were the ones who converted. They were called new Christians, but he was a, you know, rather than being burned at the stake or killed, he, his family converted on the surface, but practiced, continued to practice Judaism. Uh, but they fled to Amsterdam in 1603. He was ordained as a rabbi at 18, read 10 languages and wrote books in five of them. He also was um, responsible for much of the education of Benedict Baruch Spinoza, Benedict Spinoza, the great philosopher, who I think is probably the most important post-Enlightenment philosopher in, in Europe. He also was a friend of Rembrandt, and Rembrandt uh, made a portrait of his son. So by 1650, um, like I said, Man Manasseh Ben Israel and his contemporaries um, did believe that you know that the, the Messiah could, perhaps was very close. Um, and that this was a ripe time for this in Europe because when the, the Catholic Church broke away, I'm sorry, when the, 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 the English Church broke away from, Catholic, from the Catholic Church, there was kind of a reckoning. Um, in England at the time, the anti-Semitism that was rife in the Catholic Church from the very beginning, from its origins, the Church Fathers, if you read the Church Fathers' writings, um, they were, all of them were, were virulently anti-Semitic. Um, you know, the breakup of, with, with a former boyfriend, girlfriend, you break up, you know, either you stay friends or you have to hate the other one to move on. Obviously, the church wanted to just cut ties and they had to, you know, so this breakup was not smooth. And the church fathers early on were um, very anti-Semitic in the writings. Uh, so the church maintained this legacy of anti-Semitism. But in England at the time, this break was a reckoning of sorts. So in a nascent uh, philo-Semitism, that is a anti-anti-Semitism, a philo-Semitism, a, lo a love or interest in Jewish Jewish matters in Jew in the Jew, um, was starting to to grow. Not to say England was free of anti-Semitism. There were pernicious legends like the legend of Saint Hugh, little Saint Hugh, who was uh, li libellously said to have been killed by the Jewish community, crucified, and this we found this in ballads in Scottish and English culture, little, he was a, a young boy who was supposedly killed. Of course, this slander, this libel has been through the ages and different, interestingly enough, the Jesuits were, were accused of the th same thing by the Japanese when they first came to Japan, that they were killing children and eating them. So to, some, to demonize somebody, what do you, you take, what do you do? You take the cutest, sweetest, purest thing and say, hey, they kill this or eat this or whatever. So this is not just a slander you see against the Jews. Um, though, of course, they have bared the brunt of this to more than anybody else. Um, so, but this, the, this anti-Semitism was starting to be replaced in certain quarters by a philo-Semitism. The power, the reduced power of the established church uh, made this even more possible. So within this milieu, 
Um, there is this spiritual kinship, this strong belief in the second coming of Jesus. Um, and Jews as being the central protagonists had to be, you know, come back together, Deuteronomy 2864, this ingathering. Um, and here we have a community of Jews in China. What could be more auspicious than that? So Manasi ben Israel uh, petitioned, um, was able to petition the, um, the Lord Protector, um, Oliver Cromwell, who after Charles I was killed in the English Civil War, after he started the English Civil War, Oliver Cromwell, the great general, stood in for five years roughly uh, and took control of England. He's called the Lord Protector because he's the protector. He's not the king. He took that term. And um, Manasi ben Israel was able to, through him, petitioned the English parliament. And um, this small community in, 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 in China uh, had enormous effects because if he says to England, you know, you want the second coming to come, well, you got to have the Jews back. You expelled us in 1290 and we've been, you know, wandering around. But if you invite the Jews back, isn't this the best thing you could possibly do to, to hasten the second coming of Jesus? Now, of course, this, you know, this, um, uh, doctrine would not be palatable to a Jew, but he had his own agenda, and um, he was on good terms, fortunately, with powerful figures in, in European and English society who were able to make this happen. So there were um, people who dissented, who said, no, there were new slanders that were made. The Jews wanted to take over the Bodleian Library at Oxford. They wanted to convert St. Paul's Cathedral into a synagogue. But in the end, it did pass, and the Jews were through the back door, somewhat hush-hush, but they were welcomed back into England. Uh, so this is amazing that something so important, something so big happened from a community that was out, just not known at all, you know, a few decades earlier. Now, an interesting uh, point here, and I, I'm looking at my time very um, conscientiously here. Uh, so interestingly, um, there is a passage in Isaiah that um, Manasseh ben Israel is able to hold on to, as part of his campaign to, you know, have the Jews bring the Jews back to England, he pointed out that Isaiah forty nine twelve, uh, the passage runs in, in, trans, in translation: "Be look, these are coming from afar, these from the north, these from the west, and these from the land of Sinim." Now, Manasseh ben Israel asks what Sinim is. Okay, so he thought, mm, okay, this is interesting. So he turns to of all people, Ptolemy the great Greek geographer uh, who identified Sinim as China, okay? Now, what Manasseh ben Israel did not mention so much is that the authoritative biblical uh, commentators in Judaism, like Abraham, Ibn Ezra, uh, Rashi, David Kinchi, did not um, place Sinim as China, but rather on the southern border of Egypt, southern border of Egypt, or as the land of the south, as it was sometimes termed. But Manasseh ben Israel had a bigger agenda in mind, and he said, no, this is wrong. They were wrong. Uh, Sinim is China. Now, yes, today, Sinim does mean Chinese, okay? Uh, I would like to do a, I can't say, I don't want to speculate, a, you know, linguistic investigation of why modern Hebrew has Sinim, perhaps based on this and based on Manasseh ben Israel. Um, maybe somebody in the audience knows. Uh, I do not. Uh, I have not followed up on that one. But this was very persuasive. And as we'll see at the end in another short video that this was also one of the reasons given um, that we see biblical prophecy kind of you know, um, unfolding in real time. So again, this came to the attention of Oliver Cromwell and it, was, and it was, and for everybody else, convincing enough that they said, hey, okay, we're gonna bring the Jews back to England. Um, now there's a video I wanna show before this, um, just mentioned this will bring us right to around 45 minutes. Uh, there is um, today 55 recognized minorities in China. Uh, they have advantages because they get a certain number of government posts. They get admission, special admission into universities. Uh, they can have more than one child. The one child policy does not apply to them. And there's 55 of them. Um, there was a movement in the 1950s to bring the Jews into this, but unfortunately didn't meet the criteria, which was a common language. Because by 1950, there weren't any Hebrew speakers left. Maybe if they could read it fluently or they could read they, or had the liturgy still and they could, maybe they would give them, who knows, it's hard to say, but they weren't able to meet that criteria. I mean, there are certain groups that are a thousand people or a very, very small number, but they do have a common language um, that's still um, a living language. And Hebrew is living today. It's just that, of course, in the Chinese community at the time, there weren't any um, speakers of it, okay? So this video here is going to follow up on these five 
Chinese girls that we saw early on and look at the possibilities going forward. <laughs> Can you tell us in Chinese how you say I'm happy to be in Israel? I didn't understand, but that seemed to come out of the heart. Welcome home. Yeah, thank you. Shalom here at Arutz Sheva. We, of course, always like to uh, greet new immigrants coming to Israel. Today, a special group, five girls from China who are Jewish descendants. They came here to Israel, and this is all part of the, the activity of the Shavei Israel organization. When did you discover that you were a Jewish? When I was young, maybe seven or eight. My father and, and grandfather told me, uh, we are Jew, we need to come back to China, uh, come back to Israel. What can you tell us about the feeling when the plane landed? Well, I can't tell, you know, it's very, so exciting. I wasn't able to sleep yesterday. <laughs> yeah. What was the feeling when the, the flight came, uh, landed? Uh, exciting. <laughs> feel exciting. Uh, feel uh, magic. Yeah. Magic. Yeah. Magic. Yeah. <laughs> With God's help. Have a good luck. What we're seeing here today is uh, Jewish history in the making. Uh, the return of five young Chinese Jews on Aliyah to Israel. Uh, there was a Jewish community in Kaifeng in China since at least the 7th or the 8th century. Um, uh, about 150, 200 years ago, a process of assimilation and intermarriage set in. But until today, there are about a thousand people in Kaifeng who are identifiable as descendants of the Jewish community via family trees. And in recent years, a growing number of the young people have been looking to return to their Jewish roots. Descendants of Jews coming from where? Is this also what we define as the lost tribes, or is this something else? Uh, no, they are descendants of Sephardic Jews from Iraq or Persia who traveled along the Silk Route and settled in the city of Kaifeng, which at the time was one of the imperial capitals of China. Now, in terms of what you're talking about, assimilation, these uh, Jews, the descendants of Jews, they need to go through processes at this uh, what stage, right? Uh, that's correct. Um, they'll be studying here at a religious women's seminary, uh, preparing to undergo formal conversion by Israel's chief rabbinate. We need to, to learn um, many knowledge about the Holy Bible, uh, Tanakh, Toshba, and uh, we need to do our best. How was the feeling this morning? I mean, you, you're used to all these landings. Well, what is it, exciting every time? It's emotional every time because each person is a world unto themselves. And um, we've been struggling for the past three or four years um, to get the requisite permission in order to bring these young women here. Um, I spent a lot of time nudging and cajoling and lobbying uh, bureaucrats and Knesset members and ministers. But thank God, finally, uh, the permission came and uh, they've come home. And I want to mention there's a, a verse in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 12, where God speaks about the return, the ingathering of the exiles. And at the end of the verse, it says, Ve'ele me'eretz sinim. These from the land of the sinim. Sinim, of course, is Hebrew for Chinese. So I'd like to believe that what we're seeing today is the fulfillment of that prophetic vision. In Hebrew, the word for... Okay, so I'm just going to skip the end here quickly to show you something. I just want to... Tikva in Chinese. He said, this is a nice way to... Pretty well, you know how Tikva in Chinese, because I've heard you sing it. I can't sing it with you, but if you wouldn't mind singing it now, it would mean a lot to us. Okay. 
Okay, so, oh, sorry. So that that is uh, the end of my slides. Before I, just one more thing I wanna show you, cause there's a website that is um, something you might wanna look into if you're interested. Uh, there's a group called the Sino-Judaic Institute uh, this is the website and um, they do some amazing work. They had a school in Kaifeng getting this community you know, active again and teaching Hebrew and you know, Jew Jew Jewish studies, um, but they were forced to leave with the new clampdown by Xi Jinping. Um, but this is, they still do work. Um, they have this amazing website. I recommend if you're interested in this topic, um, looking at this as well. Um, I you know, tribute and become a, I become a member and they have a great newsletter, Points East. So this is an ongoing discussion, an uh, ongoing story, historical story, a living story that is not over and that this chapter is still unfolding. So uh, again, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions and I'm able to answer them, if I'm not, I'll tell the truth, I'll plead ignorance. Uh, please feel free to ask them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Baskin. I see we have um, one hand raised, so maybe we can just sort of use that format uh, to answer a few questions as they come in, starting with uh, Carl and Jenny. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. And, and thank you, Dr. Baskin, for this wonderful, interesting lecture. I had two questions. One is um, you mentioned the influence of that uh, the Jesuit and that the rabbi who wanted to turn over his practice to this uh, Jesuit. I was just wondering, was is there any known um, sort of influence of Jesuit, I guess, slash Christian influence on the Jews of Kaifeng? I wasn't quite sure how that story ended. If the rabbi did turn over his congregation to the Jesuit, um, or what happened there? And uh, just my other comment is also Jews went to uh, Kaifeng. Um, during, um, I guess, World War II and the Holocaust, um, and um, uh, because that was one place that they could go. And so there were Jews that um, went, I guess, in the 1930s uh, and 40s. Yeah, okay, thank you for your question. Um, good to cl clarify the first one. Uh, so yes, the Jesuits, um, Maturici um, did not become the, succeed the rabbi as the next rabbi in that congregation. Um, it, the rabbi would have soon realized, I think the more he interviewed him and got to know him that there it would be untenable, but the, there are only seven generations that were left or eight generations after that incident that they had a viable community, a viable practice. So the rabbi successor, I'm not sure exactly who it was, but it was a local, um, uh, Jew, Jew, not anybody from the Jesuits there. They, they really tried to convert. They were quite confident that the Jews would just en, 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 en masse, just, you know, take. Um, become Christians when they were introduced to the New Testament, but very few, if any. Now, there were some Jews that converted to um, Islam at, at, you know, throughout history, but very few even that, but Christianity, they, they, um, they did not. They, the Jesuits were, were kind of amazed by the atta attachment they had to their ancestral faith, so there wasn't really any Jesuits that entered into the Jewish, you know, community um, that they were able to, you know, have any kind of lasting influence um, they were more interested in not kind of getting into, but more like comparing the Torahs, making sure that, you know, maybe there'd be some hidden passages. They did not find any, uh, but this was more of their aim rather than to kind of infiltrate as, you know, active uh, members. And in the second one, yes, you're right. During World War II, uh, the whole Mir Yeshiva was saved. There were 6,000 Jews that were that from Lithuania that, um, uh, Sugihara Chiyune, a Japanese uh, fellow who was working there in the, in the consulate was able to save them. And some made their way to Kaifeng, some made their way to Shanghai. There's a Shanghai museum of, of, of Jews. There was a ghetto, you know, and not a ghetto like we know in Europe, but a, a section of, of Shanghai that was where the, the Jews were, were allowed to live and have their own, you know, um, stores and everything. So the Chinese and the Japanese, you know, Japan was on, uh, was allied with the Nazis during World War II. But they never did a thing to the Jews. I mean, even when Himmler said to Yamamoto, you know, turn your Jews over from northern China, the ones that were in, you know, in, in when, China, when Japanese took over China, uh, the, of course, the Jap Japanese did unspeakable things in China. I, I don't look past that during the war, but they did not have this institutional anti-Semitism. Anti so when Himmler said, you know, turn your Jews over from Manchuria, the ones working on the railroad or the ones and turn them over, the Japanese refused. 
Um, and they, you know, allowed these Jews to, to take safe harbor in China and some went to Japan as well. But yeah, so that, that, that is an interesting story. You're right. And there's another talk on that, the Jews of Tiyune, Sugihara Tiyune and what he did to save these Jews. Very interesting. Thank my, you. My father's family was um, some of the Jews that ended up in Kaifeng. Oh, really? Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Talk about a homecoming, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I see Sarah has a question. Yeah, you sort of answered it. Um, well, I looked, of course, at Wikipedia uh, for Chinese Jews before I listened to this. And there seemed to be an implication in there that almost all of the Jews had become Muslims and had converted to Islam, um, which I found really confusing. Mm -hmm. And is there any truth to the to the notion that over a very long period of time that it's almost as if the way it's written they were absorbed into yeah the it's hard Islamic this community is, yeah right okay thank you for that question too thank you um it's really hard to get any kind of discrete numbers um wikipedia is, on the whole is quite accurate and quite good but anybody can edit it and get you know so there's it's a lot of good information on there, but everything has to be taken, of course, you know, judiciously. Um, well, trans, you know, people who converted, Jews who converted to Islam wasn't something like you come to it, oh, I feel this is the way for me, more so than you're, you're in a community that's, that has similar rules of kashrut. I mean, it's not called kashrut, but of course it's the same, more or less the same. Uh, they, they had, you know, traditions that, monotheism, of course, as well. There were Jewish women who married, um, you know, Muslims, and that would almost invariably end up, you know, you enter the family of the, of the, of the man, and then they would become, the children would be Muslims. They wouldn't allow mixed, you know, kind of doing both religions. So it was more of a, a natural, you know, you're, they were outnumbered by a large amount, a uh, large number. Um, and in a society where you have a very small community, um, you know, that kind of being absorbed into the greater, and, and that happened with Chinese as well. That's why the Kaifeng Jews today look as Chinese as anybody, because intermarriage has been happening for generations, many generations. Um, and that, but of course in China, because it is the Chinese cultural background, it wasn't matrilineal, it was patrilineal. Um, of course, even matrilineal is, is really, well, you know, was produced, became that way during the, the Talmudic period, during the Hadrian persecutions, and I mean, Jewish mother, okay, at least you know the child's Jewish if, the, if it comes from the mother, right? So this is also something that happened along the way in Judaism too. But in China, it became patrilineal. Um, so there were there was an intermarriage with both Muslims and Chinese, um, and that's going to always move the, the numbers towards you know that because that family that you marry into. Um, but it's not true that all the Jews or even a large percentage necessarily did. But as the Jewish community in Kaifeng became ever attenuated ever weaker in its connection to its ancestral faith, you don't have that anchor anymore um, to really keep you, you know, in that community. So, that, but I, I would not take it as that it was a wholesale uh, kind of conversion to, to Islam. Thank you. Any, anybody else? Um, let's see. Oh, somebody has a question in the chat here. Um, what is the name of the Israeli Aliyah organization featured in Channel 7 story? Oh, that's uh, Shavei Israel. Uh, they have a, um, they're this organization that uh, brings Jews over from these communities that are struggling. Uh, the Chinese community is not very robust today. You know, bringing Chinese Jews to, to Israel where they can, you know, continue and, and maybe marry other Chinese Jews and keep the community going in Israel. I mean, it's, it is a piece of, 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 of Judaica as well as Sino, you know, you know, Chinese studies that, that I think is, is historical episode very precious, like anything. And um, I think it uh, is something that, you know, has a future um, with groups like that, that reach out like this. Um, somebody else asked uh, what texts were discovered in Dunhuan. Oh, wow, Dunhuan is a, it's a real cultural and scholarly juggernaut. I mean, huge amount of material, thousands and thousands of texts were in, under the desert um, the shifting sands of the desert had buried it. You know, you have Buddhist caves and large number of texts. There were some sutras that, sutras is the Buddhist term, that were talked about G Jesus in a 
you know, kind of Chinese setting. There was, some Jew there, there was a text that talked about Jews, the Radnites, um, all kinds of texts, but the vast majority were Taoist and Buddhist uh, um, in, in, in character because it was, you know, this whole cave complex were places where Buddhist monks would meditate and had their cave drawings. So, I mean, they're, they're cave paintings of the Buddha. So, it may, but it's an amazing story. Look up Dunhuang and it's, uh, uh, Ariel Stein, the one who helped discover it uh, about 120 years ago. It's an amazing story. I, th I think that was all the questions that came in, um, which is about perfect timing. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for your thoughtful questions. And of course, thank you to doc Dr. Baskin for joining us today. Um, and I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors at Congregation Orzion uh, for your partnership in today's program. Um, I just want to make a quick note that our program that was originally scheduled for next week um, about women's resilience in the Holocaust has been postponed. So if you had registered for that, stay tuned and we will send you the new date as soon as it becomes available. Um, and our next program will be The Problem of Evil with guest speaker Samuel Levins on August 31st at 10 a.m. Pacific. So we hope that you can join us for that one as well. And thank you all for being here with us today. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.